again. So we... Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here again. We're in uh, First Peter chapter two. We're going to kind of finish up what we talked about last week and kind of continue. If you have the notes from last week, the first couple pages are the same. We're going to get a little bit something different towards uh, uh, verse eleven. Uh, as you look at this, we're going to make a switch tonight because when you come up to chapter two, verses one up through two ten, chapter the beginning of the book to two ten. That is, if you want to divide it this way, you can decide as you look at this. The first part is kind of theology, kind of a, Peter's doing some teaching, he's doing some encouraging, giving them some theology. So we can call that first part teaching in a, in a very general sense. But then beginning in verse 2, 11, it just, you know, we just read through it. It, it flows into it very naturally here. Uh, but beginning in verse 11 tonight and going to, say, chapter somewhere in chapter 5, this is now application. And he's going to get into now, here he kind of encourages the people with some teaching and it kind of develops that framework, that foundation. Here's where you are, here's what's going on, here's what God thinks, here's where your ultimate finish is going to be. And there's a little bit of application in here, but a lot of teaching. What we get now, beginning in verse 11 here tonight, as we get to there, we're going to start heavy application. This is how you live, this is what you should be doing, and helping them apply it. And just like up in this first part, the teaching, there was scattered application in here during this application part, there's going to be scattered theological statements. He'll, he'll make some application, then he'll make a theological statement either to confirm what he just said or to begin what he's going to go to. So basically, if you want to divide it this way, uh, and there's different ways of dividing the book, uh, you got the first half, and then beginning that, we're going to start chapter 2, verse 11, the second half of the book where Peter kind of switches directions. Uh, so let's bow our heads. I'll pray. I'm going to kind of talk about a few things from last week. And then we'll move on into uh, chapter 2, verse 11, and going on that, uh, that way. Father, we again thank you for the chance to be here. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to hear the, the, the Spirit of God speak to us through the Scriptures. And we ask that we may not only learn and understand uh, greater things about God and His ways, but also empower ourselves to live a life that is pleasing to you and make wise decisions at this time in history. Again, Father, we thank you for your presence with us. And ask again that your Spirit would speak to us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and begin in uh, chapter 2, verse 4, and uh, read through this. This is chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So again, what they're saying right here, as you come to him, we just got them talking about the verses right before this, about how you should put away the, the sinful nature and then turn towards taking in the spiritual food, the Word of God, renewing your mind, and grow up and progress into the salvation. And now you're coming to Him. And again, this, as you come to Him, again, that's probably not a reference to coming to Christ in salvation, but probably coming to Christ in your growth. They're already in Christ, but they're coming to Him as they're growing and maturing, as they take in the truth, the Word of God, renewing their mind, as they grow up in their salvation. And as they're growing in Him, as they're coming to Him, the first thing He points out is, remember, this Christ you're coming to, this living stone you're coming to was rejected by men. You're going the opposite direction. So if you're going to grow in Christ, get ready. First warning, you're going to be going away from the culture. You're going to be going away from, even if you look in chapter 2, verse 11, where we're going to end it, or not end, but get in tonight. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. So right there, that's the, the worldly desires or the flesh that is warring against you. Once you start growing in Christ, you're going to notice there is a rejection. You're, you're not going the way of the, the flesh. You're not going the way of the world. You're going a different direction. So he encourages you right there. says that's exactly what happened to Christ. If Christ had gone the direction of the world, he would have gotten crucified. He would have been, you know, very at the very beginning when Lucifer offered him the king. If he just would have cooperated, you could have gone to the top. You could have been somebody, man. But instead, you turned and went the other way. And Peter's kind of saying that the same thing here. As you come to him, so you're going to start growing in your salvation, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God. So men rejected him, but he was chosen by God and precious, meaning he's very valuable. You also, and it's the same exact phrase, living stones, you are not Christ, you are not God, but you are now growing into him. So you, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So as we review these verses, just recognize all, we're going to re look at it here in just a moment, all the references to Israel that have now been transferred to the church. And here's, here's one of the first ones. You're being built into a, 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 a spiritual house, which is a temple. 
to be a holy priesthood. You're going to offer sacrifices. Here it is, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God to, through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. That's Isaiah talking about that. It never be put to shame. You trust him, you'll never be embarrassed. You'll never be disappointed. You're going to turn your back on the ways of the world. And you can see Jesus confidently speaking this way during his three temptations. His confidence is like, not, I, I know where I'm going. It's like, you're going this direction. You're, you'll never be embarrassed choosing the way of God. You'll never be embarrassed choosing the word of God for your spiritual growth and turning your back on the ways of the world. That's kind of what it means. You'll never be put to shame. And that word never is in the strongest negative in the Greek. Never. It's impossible. You go this way, you cannot. It's impossible for you to be put to shame or embarrassed or what you trust in fails you. Verse 7. Now, to you who believe, when we understand this, this stone that you believe in, is precious. Just like it was precious to God, you now have tasted that goodness. You've now tasted the value of Jesus Christ is precious to you also. You, you cherish this. You treasure this. But, on the contrary, to those who do not believe, well, here's another verse. If you do not believe in Christ, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So it is really the pivoting point of history, of the individual's life. What do you think of Jesus Christ is pivotal for your eternal destiny? And if you don't accept him, you're going to fall in the same place the builders who were building the Jewish nation in the first century. They're the builders of the Jewish culture, the history, the religion. They examined him and they rejected him. That's what the word rejected means. Again, it means to examine, dokimazo, to examine, but to then throw it away. It's like we tested it. It's not going to work with what we want. We're going a different direction. So they tested Jesus Christ, threw him aside, and now because they threw him aside, he's now in a sense laying on the pavement, and they can't get around him, and so they're going to have to do something with him. The only thing they do with him now is stumble on him. A stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. If you inspect Jesus Christ and you accept him, you bring him in, you begin growing in Christ, he becomes the capstone. You will never be ashamed, and you're part of that building. You're going places. But if you examine him and say, I don't think we can use this in all of your wisdom, and you toss him aside, well, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Of course, we spent some time on that last week. They stumble because they disobey. Because you've thrown Christ aside, you're going to now stumble. Because you've disobeyed the message, which was what? Believe in Christ. Accept Christ. The, the message was not, you know, stop sinning or stop drinking or stop smoking or stop swearing. The message was, here's Jesus Christ. And obedience to the gospel is accepting Christ, coming to faith in Christ, and then you begin to grow in your salvation. They stumble because they disobey. Because they disobeyed, they begin to stumble. And uh, the message, uh, excuse me, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Now, this is, of course, a pivotal verse on which we are going to go with. Uh, uh, we talked about Calvinism last week. I promise we wouldn't talk about it again this week. But we've got two basic circles, the way I explained it right here. This group right here is the, the group. This group, if you're in this group, you're destined to fail because in here you have said no to Jesus Christ. You said no to the ways of God, and this circle will always fail. It will, this circle, just like we read, you say yes to Jesus Christ, just like we saw there, you will never be put to shame. This circle will always, as emphatically as you can say, will always be taken care of. And so here you are. The question is, do you say yes to Jesus Christ? You will never be put to shame. You say no to Jesus Christ, you will never, never succeed. You're going to perish. And now, the question we talked about last week is this question mark here. Are you destined to say yes? And some are destined to say no. You can read it that way, but as we explained in the Greek and, and other scholars that, that are, not other scholars, but the scholars that I've read, many of them, explain the language is right here, as we, just in the review, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. They are destined to stumble. The destiny, you don't have to accept this, but you've got to, you either got to explain it in a Calvinistic way, or you've got to come at it another way. And I think the Greek supports this in this verse. And like I said, it's not my idea. It's other than their scholars that are teaching it. What it's destined is this circle and this circle. You will never fail. You are destined. Because you are a believer in Christ, 
you are now destined for glory. You're going there. These people are destined to perish. They stumble because that is what they were destined for. They weren't destined to say no, but they rejected it. They said no, and now they're in their circle, and now they will stumble because they're in the circle that is destined to stumble. You go here, you're going to stumble. You're destined to stumble. You're not destined to go in that circle. You're destined to stumble when you get in that circle. If you read, that's the way the Greek reads. That's the way the English reads. I talked to some English teachers, and they explained all the different word positions right there. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Okay, now the contrast comes right here. Well, we got some things at the top of the page we can look at, but I think we're going to just read on here and, and move on. I've got some references at the top of the page right there, which would be fun to look at. The first four are talking the same thing of being destined. Disobedience, you're destined to fail. Uh, remember this verse right here. God sends them a great delusion that will mislead them. But there, God sends them a great delusion and purposely misleads the people. We talked about this when we talked about Thessalonians. He sends them a delusion that, that will mislead them. It's like, why would God mislead the people? Because, it says, he said, because they rejected the truth. They said no to the truth. And so now God says, okay, now that you're in the circle, let me send you something you will believe. And he sends them a delusion that those who have rejected the truth will not follow. If you have accepted the truth, you're going to continue to grow in the truth. But if you're over in the circle, you're still looking for truth. You're still wondering, what is truth? You guys say, okay, all right, here. Will you believe this? Sure you will. And sends them a powerful delusion that leads them astray. And so the reason they're here and they accept it, very clearly Paul explains, is because they've said no to truth, they've said no to this circle, and they've gone in here and God sends them a delusion. That is not beyond God's character throughout the Bible. Even in the Old Testament, we talk about him sending false prophets and things to what? Test the people. It's like, let me test your heart. Here, if you have accepted the truth and you're following the word of God, you're following, in a sense, Moses' revelation, and he sends you this delusion or this false prophet, you're going to say what? Absolutely not. But if you are not following it, you're going to say yes to the delusion or the false teaching or the false prophet. And that top right there, those are some verses that kind of refer to things like this. We're going to get into Romans later tonight and maybe bump into some verses similar to that. But then those next verses begin with John 1, John 3. Those are verses that is clearly, I think, you can see human responsibility for those who believe, for those who do not believe. And so there's your human responsibility. Again, I'm not saying it's an easy task, but it is, it is a, a challenging task, and, and many people you know, try to go down the middle somehow, and maybe that's where we should be. It depends on how you look at it as far as destiny. But clearly, God, for me to, to kind of wrap this up, if God is just and he is going to bring punishment to those who disobey and those who say no, how, again, in my mind, in my Christian God image, and I, have, I understand the God, the, 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 the theological characteristics of the eternal God that I have been presented and I have embraced and the God that I have chosen to follow that I think is described in the Bible, this God is just, and for this God to then cause this person to say no, he's going to then, God is going to uh, uh, destine this man to say no, and then because the man said no, he's going to punish him. It's kind of like, what? I mean, that's like setting your kid up to do something wrong and then punish them when they do it. Now, you can test your children. We test students. People are tested which way you're going to go. Now, if you, you learn the lesson and you, you succeed, there'll be good things. If you fail, there'll be negative things. A test is different than destiny. Destiny means you have no chance of passing the test. I am going to fail you, and then I'm going to punish you for failing. It's like, what? Uh, again, maybe that makes sense. But to me, you've just destroyed, you've, you've infiltrated the character of God. Many people do not have trouble with that or they navigate their way around that differently. So, that's the end of that conversation. We went through quite a bit on that last week. Okay, verse 9. You don't have to agree with me, please. You don't have to agree with me. That's how I navigate through it. Verse 9. After having said, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. They were destined to stumble because they disobey. But you, you are a chosen people. Now right here, why are we going to heaven? Why are we in the church? Why are we believers? Because God chose us. You can go right there. God chose you, and so now you're a Christian. But I think we're contrasting these two circles. They're in this circle, and they're destined to stumble. You have accepted Christ. You've come into Christ. You're growing in Christ. So you're now... A chosen. This circle is chosen. These are God's favorite. These are God's people. And here we go. A huge list 
that's going to continue what began in chapter 2, verse 4, talking about that building, the priesthood, the spiritual sacrifices. Peter's going to continue. This is the list continuing. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, at this point, I'm going to say that's the end. That would, that would be a good place to put a chapter break. You, but now you have received mercy. Okay? That ends that section, chapter 2. Now, again, it's not really chapter 2, but now he begins chapter, chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers. Now he goes on to another topic. You know, I mean, continuing his thought, but now he's just switched. He kind of, that was kind of the climax of that whole run. Did someone say that? I thought someone said Galen. I thought, I thought he was having a there. Oh, Jim's not here tonight. I just heard Jim. I was waiting for Jim to say something. Okay. Chapter 2, verse 4, going up to chapter 2, verse 10, is a large list of things about Israel that have now been transferred to the church. And so we have this interesting thing happening now, is you've got Israel who was God's chosen, but all he, what Peter's doing here, and it's in agreement with other New Testament writers, all these things of Israel, many, I'm going to say many of the things that were Israel's blessing have been now transferred to the church, to the believers, to those who are in Christ. Now, we're, we're, I'm going to try to talk about this a little bit here as we get into this. We're not going to be setting aside, not, not to, we're not going to be replacing Israel. Some people teach that. That we have, the church has replaced Israel. Israel's gone, never going to appear again. They're in the dust of history. Uh, but this is clearly saying many of the blessings that were given to Israel, titles and identification, have now come to the believers that are in Christ. Romans is going to say, I think, we're going to see this, that Israel is coming back. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But as we look at page one of the notes, please, uh, it says, but you are a chosen nation, or excuse me, a chosen race. In verse 11, you are a chosen people. All right, they're chosen people, chosen race, chosen generation. The you is emphatic in the Greek. Uh, it should be in red in contrast in the notes that, 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 to those who are disobedient. Remember, they stumble, but you, emphatic, you, the believer, uh, is, is the point. Chosen in Christ, uh, the chosen cornerstone. And uh, again, I think we can go back to the idea there of being in that circle, contrast with those who are destined to disobey. You are now chosen. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, is anybody using last week's notes? Because if you are, the, the page numbers would be different, but they're similar notes. Uh, race is the Greek word. It means generation, uh, a common community. So when you read this here again, but you are a chosen people, in the NIV it says people. That would be the word race. Uh, you can, it can be re refer to a generation of people, a race of people. Basically what it's talking about is a, people, a group of people that are common, some kind of a common culture or a common uh, destiny, a common generation. And so these people are now, as it says, a chosen people. You, what unites you is you are in this circle. You are the chosen. Then it goes on and says, interesting after that, a royal priesthood. And the word royal comes from the word king. Priesthood is, is a reference to what was the Old Testament use of Aaron. But very interestingly, and there's some more notes on page two now we talk about this, is you know there is a group of uh, priests in the Old Testament, and there was those who were the kings. So you've got priests, and you've got kings. And those are two different groups. When you talk about here now a royal priesthood, this is those who are also, that that's where king comes from, or the, you know, the royalty. A group that is in that position is related to the royalty, but they're also serving as priests in that capacity of coming before the deity. And only the priest, and the ideal of a priest, is these are the only ones who can access the deity. That's why we want priests in our culture. That's why we have priests in the Old Testament. Is you've got your common person that's separated from God, and, and then here's the deity. If you talk about a pagan religion, or if you talk about you know Old Testament, even church, we talked about last night in reference to what was going through, even churches oftentimes are set up that way. Here's your common people, here's the deity, and then you've got your priest. You know, if you want to call him a priest, you want to call him a pastor, you want to call him whatever you call him, he's your go-between. He can hear your needs and he can present them to God. Well, that is what a priest is. They're the mediator. And they will take, they'll communicate from God. They'll communicate to the people. 
or you know, take the people's problems or needs or sins and go and make atonement or something and approach deity. So you all, uh, it says here again, but you are a chosen people. You are a chosen race. You, your group is a chosen group. A royal priesthood. You are now a royal priesthood. You are in this priesthood, which is very interesting because one of the things, and this is one of the big uh, things Martin Luther made a big issue of, was that as believers in Jesus Christ, the, you really have no need for a priest. You, you need the, you know, listen, we're not talking about the gifts within the church. There are pastors that are given to the church. There are apostles given to the church. There are teachers given to the church. There's, there's the different helps ministries, the different gifts. We all have a part. But that's not priesthood. There's no priesthood given to the church. The priesthood is Jesus Christ, and you as believers are in that priesthood. You have the very fact each one of us has a gift is an indication that you are a priest. You have direct access to God. God doesn't give. The deities wouldn't give special gifts to the common people. They may give them to the priest, but the common people were separated from the deity. They could only access the deity through the priest. But the very fact that we are a priesthood, a royal priest, we'll come back to that in a moment, a priesthood, that means we have direct access to the deity, and he in himself has gifted each believer. And it's, there's no room for even the concept of a priest or a, some kind of a special place, a mediator between the Christian and their God. The Christian should be instructed, they should be encouraged, but they should, like Hebrew says, come boldly to the throne of grace. You have access to God. And so, we. It, now I'm, I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to move on. <laughs> it's easy for a person in the position that people are recognizing as a priest. I can tell you stories. Uh, maybe I'll tell you a real quick story. Uh, and th this is... This is, not to, this is not to make fun of or anything, but to kind of show the level and how easy it is to play this. I remember pastoring a church, uh, it's probably 25 years ago now, um, and someone in the church was dying. And there's a, it was a, a community church, you know, a small, is in a community, so the person that was dying, of course, had all kinds of family, you know, all, I mean, talking about brothers and sisters, daughters and sons and wives and and, so, and they're all in the room. And they go to the church. I passed them. And, uh, and I, you know, I kind of inherited the church. I kind of came into the church and was kind of working with you know. And, and I came in the room. And it was just, it was one of my first times to walk into that situation. I walked in. And I, you know, I was teaching school. I was, just got done. We were building a house at, like, doing a, on the construction site with the, the high school class. And, just got done with school, so I jumped in the car and had to drive to the hospital. I walk in the room, you know, and and as soon as I walk in the room, they're just like, oh, good, you're here. It was like they were all just sitting on pins and needles waiting for who? The priest. I mean, then it was at that moment I walked. I tell you, I, I, I may have talked about it. I maybe was aware of it. But when I walked in that room, I had never felt the power like I felt before. And I'm not talking about charismatic power, the anointing from God. I'm talking about the eyes of the people. You understand the difference? There's the power that comes from God, and there's the power that comes from people. When I walked in that room, it was like, I'm, I'm just coming from school. I come in, it's like, oh, how's everything going? It's like, oh, we're so glad you're here. And everybody was, they were staring at me harder and more intent than they do in church on Sunday morning when I'm trying to teach them the Word of God. <laughs> but they're like, we need you now. And they're like, you know, good, can you pray for it? And it's like, and I did. But it was just that moment, and then when I got done praying and, and, and being with the people, they just, everyone wanted to thank me and touch me. So good for you to be here. Now, I think it's, it's a courtesy, you know. I, I, again, now be careful. I, you don't have to accept what I'm saying. It's, it's kind, it's polite, it's a courtesy. But when you've got a room full of believers, you don't need to wait for the pastor to get there so you can take a breath and have someone pray. Uh, but now watch. They would, they, it was hard for this group of people to listen to Bible teaching. I mean, I would teach it. I'd teach just like this. I mean, I, I'd just teach right through it. And it, they'd glaze over. They'd fall asleep. I don't blame them. I mean, I get tired. I fall asleep. If I wasn't up here talking, I'd fall asleep right now. But it's like, but they, they, it's like you couldn't teach them because they were like, it's like, didn't really hear what you're saying. If you get in that position, what were they attentive to? They were attentive to my, my priesthood. And it was, a, it was a false priest. It's a pagan priesthood. But I could present them. And if I wanted them to, I didn't let them get very close to that because it, it's not what I was trying to communicate. But you can understand, these people wanted a priest. 
not a Bible teacher. They didn't want to grow. They wanted it done for them. They wanted a mediator, not some kind of spiritual coach to get them closer to God. And if you want to play that card, if you want, if as a pastor, preacher, teacher, you want to play that card, people are willing to play that game. We'll sit and you be the priest, and and boy, there's 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 security, there's money, there's power, there's reputation, there's a collar. The whole thing comes with that position right there. Now, and I, and I, I be careful. I mean, you you can argue with me and, and disagree with me, but that that's not Peter's not saying this. He is not talking. Look at. Verse 9, I mean the whole point of this text, but you are a chosen people. You don't have some chosen people among you. You are the chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. Now this, these are so, this has been so Christianized. Everybody knows these verses. I'm going to read these. Yeah, yeah, yep, I've read that. That's in my devotion about a month ago. I remember reading it. But it's like Peter is like laying down some doctrine here. He's, he's rattling some cages. He's taking some people saying, look who you are. Yeah, they're going through some persecution. They're having some trouble. They're, they're tr going through trials. He says, and, and you're walking away from the world. You're growing in Christ. You're maturing. And understand, you are not just saved and going to heaven. You are right now on this earth a royal priesthood. Again, that priesthood means you as a people individually or as a group corporate. You have access to the deity. There's no one standing between you and the deity. And then it goes on and says, puts in front of that, it's royal priesthood, which is a priesthood, a royal priesthood would be a priesthood that would access the deity in the presence of the king. You're not just the priesthood for the people. You're the royal priesthood. You're in the palace serving the deity for the king. It's like, this is, this is amazing stuff here. Uh, yes, sir. Don't you suppose he comes down so hard on this? Because he is actually teaching Jews. He's not talking to Gentiles. And that was their whole history. Right. I mean, they all had priests. I mean, they right, and, and he, he's probably, and sometimes people preach the hardest against the thing they're the weakest. You know, yeah. Meaning, this is, he's like, he's probably like going, I, I understand. I get it. And he probably got it from Paul. You know, Paul probably chewed him out enough times or whatever. It's like, and that's what he's saying. It's like, I, he gets this now. And so Peter's saying, I know your weaknesses, so I've got to make this clear. So, I, yeah, I think Peter maybe would himself, being a Jew, obviously, obviously a Jew would, would be weak in this area. And, again, it was, they were set up that way. They did have a deity, a priesthood. And the people couldn't come. So there was lines. There were certain lines you couldn't cross in the temple. That's what that, that was our culture. And he's, he's making it very clear. There are no lines. You, and it's a terrible responsibility. I mean, a lot of times, what would you think? If you were in Israel, there'd be certain privileges and benefits of being a priest. But you wouldn't be just a heck of a lot easier just to show up on Passover and a couple holidays. You could do your own job, have your own property, live your own life, and show up for the holidays, offer a couple sacrifices, you know, pat your priest on the back, say, hey, thanks, I appreciate you working. What does he do? All year long. He's offering the priest working all year long there. And you're going, I'm, I'm glad I'm not a priest. And go back to your job or whatever, go back to your life. And so, and, and meaning, there is a certain responsibility when you find it not on. You are a priest. I don't want to be a priest. I'm sorry. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't just get to go to heaven. You are going to now serve the priest. And again, a priest, they were servants. They were serving the royal priesthood, serving the king as priest. And this is, it's prestigious, but it's a lot of work. And it's, it's still a servant, so we continue with it. Now, there's other things written on here that you can see. I'm going to just read this right here, the second paragraph on page 2. A royal priesthood would be a priesthood that belongs to the king. They are not the Levitical priesthood or some pagan Gentile priesthood, but the priesthood that belongs to the king of the kingdom of God. In other words, they are the priesthood that belongs, who's the king of the kingdom of God? They're a royal priesthood, they're a priesthood that belongs to Jesus Christ. They serve before a ruling royal priest who himself is a priest and approach deity that no one else dares to come near, if you read in Hebrews chapter 9. I mean, we're not a approaching a pagan deity. We're not approaching some other fantasy deity. We are approaching the creator of the universe. And this is not news information for you. It's just a, maybe a different angle. Well, let's go on. It says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And all these terms are the chosen people is Israel. Now it's the church. The royal priesthood would be the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. But now it's the church. 
a holy nation. That is, is the chosen people would be the ones that came out of Abraham, Abraham's descendants. Now, the holy nation would refer to those that were formed at Mount Sinai with the covenants and the law and the governmental forms that were handed to them. You are now that, that holy nation. Again, a holy nation means would be set apart. You can see I've got the notes right there. It means set apart. It refers to a people that is set apart. And remember, what was Israel for? Israel was a people that was set apart by God, chosen by God, set apart by God so that he could use them to reach the world. That's what Israel's purpose was. They weren't just sit over here and say, we're better than you and, and we've got a temple and you don't. God says, I've got, if you go back and read the whole origin, the whole world had gone astray and God needed a representative in the earth. He says, I'm going to choose Abraham and Abraham is going to become a great nation and they will be his, his witnesses. They will testify. And what made him so upset was when his chosen people, now this is a really unique twist on the word chosen, when his chosen people rebelled against him and we're going to read a few verses here in just a moment. And he had to kick them out. He had to reject his chosen people. In fact, here we go. We're getting there. A holy nation, that means set apart, a nation set apart for his purpose. You are, it's no longer Israel. Again, this is not to set Israel aside completely for all time. But realize, if God is doing something in the earth, this may be an overstatement because God can do whatever he wants to. But as a holy nation... You are that group of people that have been set aside, no longer Israel. You have been set aside for God's purpose. If God is doing something in the earth, he's doing it how? Through the church. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the church on that corner, the church over there, the first church and stuff. But his believers, he's doing it through his believers, his royal priesthood. That is how he's functioning. He used to function. Remember, where did the prophets come from? From the establishment of the day of the nation. You, you've got Balak, probably the last pagan prophet that, that seemed to speak for God. Remember Balak in the book of Numbers? After that point, every prophet that God raised up came from where? His chosen people, his, or his, uh, excuse me, his chosen people and his holy nation. The, every prophet. Even the prophet, remember Jeremiah. Jeremiah, was he a prophet to Judah? What did God tell him? He didn't say you're going to be a prophet to Judah. What did he tell well, Jeremiah was called to be a prophet to the nations. So even when the ambassadors, we studied the book of Jeremiah, when the ambassadors came and talked to King Zedekiah, Jeremiah was waiting for them with a message to take back to their king. They, there's letters in Jeremiah that were sent to all the surrounding nations. Because if God is going to send a prophet to the nations, he's going to send a Jewish man because that's his holy nation. Why did God choose Jonah? Had to walk all the way up to Nineveh. Because you're from the nation. You're from my chosen people, the holy nation. I need a prophet to go speak to Nineveh. Why don't you raise one up over there? Uh, because you're the chosen people. They come from Israel. That has been set aside. Now when God is going to go to the world today, he's going to go to the world how? He's going to come through the believers. They're, the believers are going to be, right here, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Now, and here, you say, well, are you sure that's what it means? Well, watch. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, again, don't go get too Christianized in Sunday morning church. I mean, that you may declare the praises of him. So that's why you know, every worship leader is to use that. There's nothing wrong with using it. So we, we're here, a holy nation, to declare the praise of God. So we all shut ourselves in a building and sing songs. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I like, the, I, I particularly like guitar music during that time period okay, with, with some light show. I don't mind that. I think that's great. And, but, and that's a part of this. But when we talk about, and declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light, what was Israel called to do? Go to the temple and sing songs? They, they say, well, they would declare the praise. And, and they, David talks about that and, and, and all the prophets we were referring to. Going to the temple and they'd sing, they'd praise God. There'd be great, some of the psalms are great psalms about the progression up those, some of those steps that we walked on. There's songs about progress, the pilgrims progressing up and singing songs of praise. Nothing wrong with that. But that's not what God formed Israel for so they could sing songs to him on the temple mound. They were to be what? They were to be a blessing to the nations. There to go off and declare his wonders to the world. And that's what this is saying right here. I think well, we're going to read some more definite. Well, here, look, look on the notes right here where it says proclaim on page two. Uh, it also can be translated as show forth or declare. It's from Isaiah 43, verse 21, to tell forth my praises. The word used here in Septuagint is this word right here, eritas, means praises out of, out of Isaiah, is also used by Peter and translated excellencies or wonderful deeds. 
The Greek word means excellencies, gracious dealings, glorious attributes. The context of Isaiah 43 is the announcement that God forgives and redeems his people. And so what we need to do right here is go to Isaiah 43, please. Go to Isaiah 43 and understand what the people are proclaiming. Isaiah 43, uh, where am I going to begin? i got to get to verse 21. Oh, I'm, I'm going to take a shot at the whole chapter, folks. Here we go. Now, he realize the word, the Greek word that Peter uses is taken right out of Isaiah 43, verse 21 in the Greek Septuagint. Okay? That's the Hebrew trans, or the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And so Peter is taking a word in, in his Greek Septuagint, he's taking a word right out of Isaiah 43 and bringing a verse and putting it right in context right here. And this this... This, I think, is going to tell us what declared the praises of him. And remember, of him who did what? Who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So here's the experience. You've just, if, if, if the experience is you're stranded on the side of the road without gasoline, you're going to declare the praise of him who just gave you, brought you gasoline to get you back on the road traveling. Or you're going to call the praises of him who whatever did something for you. So you're going to declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness, and brought you into this wonderful light. If you're going to do that, what are you going to talk about? You're going to talk about what just happened. I once was here, and now I'm here. These are the things I'm being delivered from. I was a foreigner in this land. I've been rescued and taken over this land, where I've been taken out of my land of captivity to my land of freedom. That would be an example. So here we go, Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. He's talking to Israel, talking to Jacob. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. Now there's your word redemption. He's redeemed them. He's bought them back. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pat now again, in context here, he's going to be talking about bringing them back out of Babylonian captivity. There's been two great events. One, the exodus out of Egypt. Another, the return from Babylonian captivity. God went and brought his people out of Egypt when they were disobedient. He put them over into Babylon, and then he came and got them and brought them back. So that's what he's talking about. He's prophesying this. When you pass through the waters, probably the Euphrates River, I will be with you. When you, when you pass over to the other side, you pass through the Euphrates River, I'm with you in Babylon. That's why Ezekiel is there waiting for him. God took Ezekiel captive before the final destruction. So when they passed through the waters, they got there. Who was there waiting for him? Ezekiel. Jeremiah was shouting at him as they were leaving. And as soon as they got to Babylon, who's shouting at him when they come to the gate? Ezekiel. Hey, I've been waiting for you. You know what Jeremiah was saying was wrong is exactly what's wrong. He's like, I thought we got rid of that guy. I know. I've been waiting for you. So when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. This means in a more of a positive sense, but him being with him was that constant reminder. And when you pass through the rivers, I, they, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, who walked through the fire? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give, I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your steed. Uh, since you are my precious and honored, in, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid for what I'm, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east, from Babylon, and gather you from the west. That would be uh, uh, when they come up later, when they were taken captive, or the dispersion uh, of the Assyrian dispersion. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created, Barah, from my glory, and formed, Jatsar, and made, Asa. Those are the three different Hebrew words. Lead out those who have eyes but are still blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the people assemble. Which of them foretold this? Now he's going to start talking about how they know that he's telling the truth, that he is God. He says, who's ever, who's ever said this? Which of them foretold this and proclaimed to, the, to us the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove that they were right. In other words, he says, who has foretold you the future? And who has explained to you where we came from in the past? Bring them here. Do your, do your religions, do your false gods have someone that can explain these things? If you do, bring your, right here, bring your witnesses to prove they were right. And notice that, witnesses, to prove that their gods were right. This is going to become heavy here in just a moment for us. So that others may hear and say, it is true, it is true. But they're not going to be able to. So now in verse 10, 
you are my witnesses. What he challenges the other religions to do, let's see, who, who foretold that these things that just took place, who told you it was going to happen like this? No one knew. No one could tell. Who told you where you came from in the past? No one. They're making up legends. No one knows where we came from. But he says, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen. Who's he talking to? Israel. I have told you where we're going. And we went there and came back, just like I said. And I've explained to you where you came from. You are my witnesses whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. In other words, the Word of God, the testimony here, is there to prove that God knew where He was going, knew where He came from. He's right. Before me no God was formed, nor were, will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no one, no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I, and not some foreign God among you. Notice what he says, I have revealed that means revealed his revelation. He has saved, that means delivered them, and proclaimed, and then explained to them, made his message, proclaimed his victory. I am not some foreign God among you. Here it is again. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. You're getting a feel for what we're supposed to be declaring. You see, I mean, declare the praise of him. Nothing wrong with raising your hands, shouting hallelujah, saying so. I, I love that. But the context here is going off and challenging the rest of the world, challenging the nation. We have God. We know the truth. We know where we're going. We know where we came from. God has revealed it to us. Who's going to do it? Israel was his witness. If Israel didn't do it, the prophets came. If they didn't do it, well, it didn't get done, in a sense. And that's why Jesus says, okay, since you're rejecting me, then I'm going to find someone more worthy. I'm going to find someone that's worthy of this, and that's where the church has come from. And now we are, they say, wow, isn't that great? We got this responsibility. Right, exactly. You got this responsibility. And what did Israel do? They didn't do it, and now are we doing it? Are the believers doing it? Now, again, that's, uh, that's just the context. I think. <laughs> no one can deliver out of my hand when I act who can reverse it. Verse 40, this is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your, the, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, probably the Red Sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses and the army and reinforcements together, and there lay there, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. In other words, I brought them out. They're still laying there in the sea. Verse 18. Forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. Forget what former things? Forget Egypt. See, I'm doing a new thing. In other words, you're still hung up on how great it was down in Egypt. He said, hey, I drew them out. I brought them to the Red Sea. They're still laying there. The chariots are still at the bottom of the Red Sea. But now God says, forget that. I'm going to show you something better. Uh, do not dwell on the past. Stop looking back and look at what I'm doing today. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Now he's talking about, I, this is Isaiah writing in 700 B.C. And he's referring to the return in 535 B.C. So Isaiah is like pretty clear why people didn't understand what Isaiah was talking about. He's 200 years ahead of time. Now it's, but that's what God was saying right here over there in those verses like uh, 11, 12, 13, meaning... Can anybody tell you what's going to happen? I'm going to tell you, and I'm already rejoiced about what I'm going to do. And I'm getting it written in text, so when it happens, you'll go, oh my gosh, Isaiah was right. His God must be true. And you got what? Isaiah serving as a witness. See, I'm doing a new thing, not the Egyptian thing, the Babylonian thing in about 200 years. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? You got to think guys like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel began to perceive it. I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not wearied yourself for me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with sacrifice. Notice what there, I mean, we, we just read right past the verse. You see that, that verse right there? Isaiah 20, 43, verse 21. There it was. Did you catch it? Mm -hmm. The people I formed for myself, for, they, for them to that may, may proclaim my praise. In other words, I'm going to come get you and bring you back 
Why? So you'll be amazed at what I did. I told you I'm taking you to captivity. I told you I'm bringing you back. And now you're here. And I want you to tell everybody what I did. That you may proclaim the glory. Not just stand in the temple and sing. But you may proclaim that I am God. But notice right here. Yet you, you have not called upon me, O Jacob. I am doing these impressive, amazing things. Probably the problem going back up there is, uh, do you perceive it? Verse, what is it? Verse, verse 19. See, I'm doing it now. Do, do any of you perceive it? Does anybody see? Well, if you don't perceive what God is doing, it's going to be hard to get excited about it because you're too spiritually dead. You have not brought me sheep. Neuronomy goes on and talks, and we can continue. Uh, and it basically, it's about redemption back out of Babylon. Okay, let's go back to 1 Peter, please. That was a detail I wasn't planning on getting too far into tonight, but there it was. I'm going back to 1 Peter and put this in context. And that is, again... Peter draws that right out of, out of the Old Testament there, out of Isaiah. So I'm going to go back and read this again. I appreciate your patience. Verse, chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. And you take those four references and tie them in with what you saw in verse 4, the holy priesthood, the temple, the spiritual sacrifices. It is pretty clear Peter's taken what was given to Israel and Jesus said it was going to be. You're going to take this and give it to a people that will produce its fruit. He's going to take the vineyard and give it to a people that will produce the fruit. And guess what? The church, the believers, those who are in Christ, are now that group that is responsible for the vineyard to produce the fruit that I, Israel didn't do it. So here we read this again. A people belonging to God. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Israel was to proclaim God's wonders because he took them out of Babylon. They, they kept talking about Egypt, right? God says, forget Egypt. Let's talk about Babylon. I took you there. I brought you back. Will someone witness to this? Well, now, here we are. We haven't been brought out of Egypt. We haven't been brought out of Babylon. We've been brought out of where? We've been brought out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, you can shout about Egypt. You can shout about Babylon. But you can add those same words here. But God says, see, I'm doing a new thing. I'm saving the Gentiles out of their darkness and bringing them into my glorious light. So read this again. Uh, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In these verses right here, I'm now on bottom of page 2. Uh, and, and now we're into Hosea, and I want to go to Hosea, and that, that's going to lead us into Romans with some references there in Romans, because it's going to be very clear there. Uh, what, what's taking place, I'm going to set this up for next week, and I'm going to read it into chapter 2, verse 11. What he's going to do is he's got a chosen people, which is Israel. And then he's got people who uh, are not his people, which would be, for example, the Gentiles. And now he's going to take these people who are not his people... And he's going to choose them. Well, let's read this again. Uh, Once you were not a people, and this is speaking to them as Gentiles. Once you were not a people, you're outside Israel. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. They've been brought into the chosen. So here's this circle of the chosen. Once you were not, and this is really, I think, is really kind of a hard thing to deal with for a Calvinist. Because you got people coming in and out of this chosen circle. Remember who's chosen? Israel's chosen. And so they're in the circle. But God in Hosea is going to say, yeah, I'm kicking you out. You are no longer my people. You're done. But we're chosen. Now, well, how do you do that? You're eternally chosen. Yeah, you were, but now you're not. It's like, well, which eternally what? Either eternally chosen or eternally not chosen. And so they're, they're going to be out. And God is now putting in the Gentiles. Now, what's eventually going to happen, if we're going to go to Romans next week and read this, those that were kicked out, God is going to call them back in. But they're not coming back in as Israel. They're, Israel's coming back into, right here we do this. This right here is Christ. And we are the Gentiles. We've come into Christ. Now, the whole, all the Gentiles have been invited. But those who come in are the chosen. Israel was here and they left. And now when they understand who Christ is in the Bible, you know, from Zechariah, Romans, other places, it's very clear, uh, they're going to one day realize that who Christ is, and they're going to enter back into Christ, or into Christ. And now they'll, they'll be saved. We'll get that in Romans next week. 
I'm going to read verse 10 again in First Peter. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's the end of that section, I believe. And now we begin something new. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Now here, this is really important right here, especially having, having read what we read in Isaiah. He says, do you perceive it? Do you have the ability? Jesus says, do you have eyes to see, ears to hear? Are you perceiving this? And I think if I can do this right here, this is part of, this is part of spiritual growth. Is, is, it's just like understanding math or any kind of a subject or doing any kind of a feat. You can't understand it or you can't do it until you grow a little bit, if you grow in math, if you grow in your physical strength. Uh, and the same thing. There are certain things that God is doing. You're not going to perceive it until you grow a little bit. You, you've got to mature. And Israel, God says, I'm doing these things. I'm telling you, do you perceive it? And he says, no, you, you have, you're not even hungering for me. You're not even coming after to try and grow. And now here's this verse, verse 11. I think warning them and us. And he says, dear friends. That dear friends is more than just, hi, how are you? Uh, some of the Bibles translate it as beloved. I'm on page 3 of the notes now, I think. Somewhere. Yeah, page 3, verse, chapter 2, verse 11. And I, I'm going to introduce this, and then we're going to wrap it up. Dear friends, that's, that word is, it means more like uh, uh, those he has affection for. He is concerned. He's both concerned and has affection for the people he's writing to. Dear friends, I urge you, and then you see the word urge, is it's it, the strongest form that you can use. It means to strongly urge, strongly appeal. It, it literally means, I exhort you, I beg you, please. So he says, if I can say it this way, those that I, I care about and I am concerned about, I beg you, please, as aliens and strangers, and now he identifies them, terms that we're familiar with, as aliens and strangers in this world. I'm begging you as my friend. I'm begging you as someone who cares about you because you are aliens and strangers in this land. And you know, alien, there's the words right there, aliens and strangers. We bumped into before. The first word aliens is a word that means to have one's home alongside of or basically refers to a person who lives in, in, the, in a place that is not their home. It goes back to the idea of being taken, even like this, taken to Babylon, a Jew living in Babylon. They would be a sojourner, or they would be here, they would be a alien, an alien. They're there, but they're they're not there, they're just for a while. And the next word, they're, they're almost synonyms. The next word is means to settle down alongside of. You don't have citizenship, you're not a citizen, but you're living next to the citizens. You're living in a land that's not yours. And so he said, and you know what this means, we've talked about this before. He says, those I care about, I'm concerned for, I'm begging you, please, as aliens and strangers you're living in a place you believers are living in a world that you don't even have citizenship anymore you don't have rights you don't have voting rights you're no longer part of this kingdom i beg you to abstain from sinful desires now again abstain means you can see the notes there somewhere abstain literally means hold yourself constantly back from it is in the per or the present tense which means it's a con you constantly hold yourself back from wanting to go back over there and act like you're a citizen to, to, to seek citizenship rights you are not of that abstain from hold yourself back from sinful desires or passions strong desires that are from that culture and here's the whole point i want to get to which war against your soul war is to mean it means to attack and it, it, the word against means down down on cut against come down on that war or come down on your soul so here's the part your soul you're supposed to you're a, an infant a babe in christ as we saw over there in the beginning of chapter two desiring the pure milk so that you may grow up in your salvation but you see you're in a foreign land you're in the world and the world is coming down on you. And if you go ahead and give into those passions and lusts, that simply, it's going to come down on your soul, and you're not going to be able to grow because you're being oppressed by the by the world. There's no growth. It's not about losing your salvation. It's about growing in your salvation so you can perceive what God is doing, so you can declare the praise that I was once darkness, I've gone into light. But if you're having trouble with the passions and being overcome, the world's coming down on your soul, you're not growing. You're not losing your salvation either, but you're being neutralized, and you're in the same place Israel was. You're not seeking after God. You're not proclaiming His glory. Does anyone see this? Does anyone perceive what God's doing? 
no, no, but we're, we're having trouble with the world. Okay, that's kind of where Peter's heading. And again, it's not just a nice little Sunday school book that he's writing. He's writing to a people that he cares about that are in another, you know, several countries away that he's trying to plead with them to understand who they are in Christ and that they're having trouble in the world is normal because you should be growing this way away from that and you're going to be rejected. There's going to be some rejection. There's going to be some hardships. And if you look back and go, I don't want those hardships. And now it's going to start warring against your soul. You're going, to, you're going to start losing not your salvation, but your perception. And you're not going to have anything to declare. It's like, we just don't have anything to talk about. We have nothing to say about God. Yeah, you'll still be talking about Egypt or something or Babylon when you could be talking about you coming out of the darkness into his wonderful light. But you've got to perceive it first. Okay, I'll pick this up next week. I appreciate your time. And, and thank you for sitting through a, a rehash of some of the Calvinistic kind of stuff. That, that's over. We're moving on quickly now to application where everybody can agree that sin is bad and good is right. So thank you very much. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We do thank you again for your truth. We thank you for your word. And we ask that we may again hear these things, that we may perceive these things, that we may continue to grow and do the things you've called us to. Again, Father, I thank you for working in our lives and doing the things you've called us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.